Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 27 with AD Vivesh. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson-Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Uh, this week we've got a fantastic guest for you, someone I'm really, really excited about having on the show, AD Vivesh, who uh, was previously um, worked at Chelsea in the academy, worked up uh, his way up and was uh, under-18s coach, under-23s coach, um, famously lifted the uh, UEFA Youth Champions League and uh, now went on to um, work at Coventry and has just successfully helped them win promotion uh, as assistant manager. Now, um, I often talk about my time at Chelsea working in that club and reflecting uh, what were the main takeaways for me and really uh, is about working in that world-class environment. Uh, The mentality there was uh, second to none, something I've never experienced before. And AD really epitomised that for me, Um, his approach, uh, his attention to detail. uh, He had that mentality about him all the time. Uh, he was really focused and, and was really inspiring to be around and watch him work. So really fortunate, had some time there uh, to learn of him and, and really uh, privileged that he decided to come on the show and uh, share some of his knowledge and his experience. And, you know, this is a really, a really, really fantastic episode. Lots of lots of knowledge, uh, lots of uh, opportunities to learn from uh, from AD, really one of the best in the game there is. So really excited to have him on the show. Um, uh, if you are enjoying the show, please do leave a review. Um, it really is really helpful. So uh, that would be really great. Uh, busy season, summer camp season coming up. Uh, my personal football coach app. Uh, we're working a lot with clubs now and organisations, um, supporting them, uh, delivering the app as part of their package for their players on their camps. So uh, players are coming to the camps and uh, whether they're residential or just week long camps and uh, their, their companies and clubs are giving their players the app uh, as part of their, um, their camp experience. So really adding value to their camps. Uh, so if you're interested in, in that, please just touch base uh, with myself and uh, we can let you know how we can uh, add value to your camp experience and your campers uh, experience. Uh, also, um, the 5 to 7s program is now out. Uh, pre- uh, really excited about it. Um, this is a new program. Part The part 1 and 2 are out. Um, it's uh, probably one of the best courses we, we put together. There's lots and lots of content on there. Uh, for whether you're a beginner or you're advanced 5 to 7 year olds. There's a big scale with players uh, ability in that age group so it was really important to make sure we got someone for something for everyone in there but I'm really happy how it looks so uh, if you're interested in the five to sevens program go to mypersonalfootballcoach.com now uh, or just go and download the app the my personal football coach app from the app store so now we have the five to sevens program we've got the eights to elevens the 12 to 16s and the 17s plus so really something for everyone on there so things going really well uh, should be an exciting summer. We've got some uh, trips coming up, which I'm really looking forward to. Meeting some some uh, players and coaches. Going to uh, Georgia, um, Atlanta, Georgia, and then um, Marbella in September, and then back to uh, Asia, Bangkok and Hong Kong in the uh, in in the autumn. So if you're interested in uh, in in, uh, in in connecting, just let me know. And uh, without further ado, let's get in the show. So, AD Vivesh, welcome to the show. Hello. Um, can you just give us a brief um, little brief uh, description of your playing and coaching history to this point, please? Yeah, uh, I was, I'm an ex-professional player. I played for 20 years, uh, mainly for my hometown club, Swindon, uh, Walsall and Reading, with the main three teams. Um, managed to win five promotions in that time, so a pretty successful career. Uh, from 16 to 36 and then um, in coaching I was a player manager at Siren Sister Town in the Southern Premier League first then joined Chelsea's Academy uh, in 2008 as an under 12 assistant coach worked my way up there to under 23's lead coach 
uh, and my role at the moment is assistant manager at Coventry City, which is in the uh, EFL, and we've just won promotion from League Two to uh, League One via the playoffs. Yep, congratulations! That's a fantastic achievement. Um, just, just tell us then, how did that first coaching role at Chelsea come about? Uh, in the in the two previous years, I'd gone in on the summer camps, uh, as you would know, but maybe not others. Obviously, they run the, from the schools for the uh, under nines up to the under 16s, three days a week in August. I went in on the recommendation of Jim Fraser. Obviously, I know Jim from both of us being from Swindon and area. Um, went in, did some defensive work uh, sessions in the afternoons, just out out with various age groups. And uh, and then that sort of led to a position becoming available and uh, and Neil and Jim approaching me about whether I'd want to go into it, really. And so tell us about that, that first role as assistant in the 12s. Um, who were you assisting at that time? I was assisting Cyril Davis, who, uh, you know, I was very fortunate. Yeah. Um, when you talk about people who have impacted on your coaching career, then Cyril is definitely one outstanding coach, um, wealth of experience. And I was very lucky to go with him up. Obviously, it was a massive change for me because I was player manager at Sirencester, which is senior men working all day and then uh, training in the evening twice a week and playing on a Saturday. To go in and working with 11-year-old kids was uh, quite a culture shock, a uh, big change. But Cyril was instrumental in me learning very quickly uh, the do's and don'ts and sort of understanding how uh, having empathy with 11-year-old kids when... You know, Cyril was 60 at the time, so it's amazing that uh, that he was able to share that knowledge with me, and I certainly learned a lot off him, and uh, I enjoyed my time working with that, that stage of, of development, yes. So, I mean, so you, you worked your way up through the age groups, as it were, you know, to 23s, um, but how important was that, do you think, for your development, having that experience first with the seniors and then going to the 12s and then working your way up? I think it's vital that you you uh, you experience all different life skills as well. So, as I said, the empathy. I mean, that first group is people like Charlie Colke, Olerena. So, you know, they're the first players I coach. And now, when you think, you know, where they are are in senior, and Ola, you know, is in the senior Nigeria squad. So it's it's trying to work out. I think where you suit best and where you're fitted best. And I think if you don't have the experiences of working with younger kids, then you won't know where your niche is. I think I sort of learned quite quickly and maybe the powers that be at Chelsea that I was probably suited more to the top end and, you know, maybe that's that's why I moved through quickly through the age groups. But I enjoyed every stage, the 14s, the 15s, the 16s. It was all part of your learning journey. Um, but vital to where I got to in the end, Definitely, yeah. And so tell us a little bit about that environment you went into, the Chelsea, the academy. Just describe that, your initial thoughts going in there and what that was like working day to day. Well, if you you know, obviously I had, I'd never played at that level of club. Um, so to come from a, a non-league environment, Sirencester, you know, where the facilities obviously at Cobham are amazing. I think that's what strikes you first of all, the... The actual size of the and the infrastructure of the process that goes on in the academy, um, the level of detail, the the number of people working there, and obviously it grew a lot in the nine years that I was there. Um, just just a wealth of knowledge and talent, and um, everybody trying to reach a common goal. And you know, the summer camp, my first experience, obviously where you see the the scouts and the drivers and the the ladies doing the food and, and, and all of it in operation at one time is, is quite a quite a thing to behold really and um, yeah, I felt very fortunate to, to be involved in it and um, you had to sort of pinch yourself a little bit of what you were going into but once you were there you, you knew that obviously it was about producing on a day-to-day -day basis um, to try and improve players as human beings and, and as footballers day in day out uh, it's a massive challenge and you know they certainly head on approach it at Chelsea and um, 
that's why they're they're widely regarded as you know one of the best academies, if not England in Europe. So then, talk about your own professional development within that environment. You're you're relatively new to coaching. I mean, how did you develop as a coach? Obviously, you're very fortunate to work with Cyril. I work with Cyril. He's very you know very knowledgeable guy, great coach. And did you did you pick up from other people? I mean, did you learn from other sources? How do you develop yourself at that time and even now? Well, I think you you obviously you you're going through your coaching um, stages while you're working on the job, if you like. So I was still. I'd got my A license. Uh, I'd worked towards that while I was doing the part-time coaching. I man, I went on to do my pro. So you learn from that. I think you learn from outside sources. You, I took quite a lot from business. I've had quite a lot of meetings with business people. I think there's a lot of link between that football, how you drive staff every day to get the best out of them. I think watching good coaches is also always um, a good source of seeing how people interact with players, with other staff. So I took a lot from that, watching top managers. I was very lucky as to be at Chelsea at a time when they had arguably three or four of the best managers in the world uh, come through that nine-year period. You're able to look and see. And, and although you've got to be your own person, you can still learn a lot from, from observing. And I, I like going to presentations. Um, I like seeing people on stage. Um, I've been to leaders, I've presented to leaders in New York. So there's a lot of outside sources you can use. I think the emergence of social media and online tools and being able to really Google somebody and watch a session from halfway across the world is, has given all coaches a, a different platform to look at and, and maybe tweak little things that they do. But I think it's very important you're your own person. So. I learned off a lot of the good coaches at Chelsea, coaches elsewhere, but I think it's very important that you're your own person and and you mould yourself, and that takes time, and you learn on the job, as I said, so you work through your processes along with the the academy structure, and in the end, you, you sort of come out a rounded person and a, and a better coach. So then tell us a little bit about your journey then at Chelsea, working your way up. What was your your first full-time role then within the, the academy? Uh, well, I went from I went from the 12s and then uh, in a pre-season, there was a lot of change that time. So Paul Clement had been moved up to the first team. Neil Barth rang me when I was on holiday. I was still part-time, asked me to come in to work with him for pre-season with the, uh, with the old reserves. Now they're the 23s, but it was reserve team then because... Clem had moved up and, and he want, he was asked to do it in the interim before they appointed someone, which happened to be Steve Holland, who obviously now is assistant England manager. Um, and I went in with Neil and that was like the first time in September 2008 that got turned into a permanent role. So I started working permanently with Steve with the, uh, with the old reserves. I did that for six months. Um, but to be fair... <laughs> Steve didn't really need anybody because he was very hands-on and, and did it all himself. And it's very different than it is now where the two age, two coaches to each age group are there at that stage. You didn't really need it unless you were, uh, you were open and engaging with it all. I felt that I needed to be working a little bit more. Uh, Neil Barth, obviously head of the academy, agreed. And I then went from there at the Christmas to become the, uh, the under-16 coach. So that was really when uh, when the full-time journey on my own, if you like, started. Um, likes of Nathaniel Chalabar, people like that were in that age group at that time. So very challenging group, a lot of really top players have gone on to be Premier League players. And um, yeah, I enjoyed that. It was good education. And then thinking about when you move up then to the youth team, um, when, when, did you, when did you make the step up to the, to the 18s? Uh, I went to the 18s in uh, 2011. Uh, obviously, Dermot has been the youth team coach. I'd assisted Derm on the Youth Cup, um, which we, uh, you know, it's great for Derm to win that. Uh, God bless him. Uh, that first win after 50 odd years um, was an amazing achievement. And and then Derm was approached about taking on the, the, the 21s, it was then. I mean, it's changed so many times the name, but. 
he he was approached about that. He moved up, and and I was approached about taking the youth team. So I did the youth team from 2011 2014, three years. Um, it's probably the role I enjoyed the the most, I would say, because you've got the structure of working Monday to Friday, and your matches are on a Saturday. Um, youth cup obviously goes in the midweek when it starts, but that core work that you can do day in day out to uh, to see the improvements in the players over time because ultimately that's how you're judged as a coach or you should judge yourself is can you see the work you're putting in day in day out on the training field uh, in the lecture room uh, individually with players can you see that come out on the on the pitch and i think if you play saturday You've got a nice structure to your week, and uh, yeah, I love being a youth team coach. I think it was a very rewarding job, and and uh, what was yeah, it? What was it? Was there like? Um, do you think? I mean, you, you know, we both know about the winning mentality at Chelsea, and then obviously, yeah. like I say, Derm, God rest his soul, he's been on the show. We had a fantastic uh, chat. He's um, was there pressure? Do you think to 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 keep that momentum going, to keep that winning going at, at the youth team level? Well, I think when, when I took the job, I mean, we don't, Durham would have been the only person who'd won it. So at that stage, it was still relatively new. I think the pressure for winning, I think, comes from within. Um, and I think the, the groups you took, well, I found that they didn't want to be the team that went out early in the competition. And that's what happens if you set a marker down and, and win something. The groups that follow, um, they want to they want to achieve as well and I think that's what I found um, obviously we got to three finals in the three years and won two but I still took as much out of the loss to Norwich in the fact that if you're talking about development you know we played in a final at Carroll Road in, in front of 30,000 people and for young players it was amazing that um, yes was it disappointing to lose of course but in the bigger picture those boys experienced what they're going to face week in, week out is, you know, so many more people than usually. 200 at Cobham on a Saturday to, hmm. to 30,000. And I think, yeah, so I think winning since then, obviously, as time's gone on, you know, the run has been absolutely astounding. Um, and now I would imagine that there is quite a bit more pressure, again, from within, from the players to not be that one. For coaches, I think you want to be your own person and uh, obviously to win the Youth Cup, I was very fortunate to be one of that select group that have done it. Um, what was that like for you, um, AD? Just, I mean, you know, obviously you've played at uh, a high level. You've used to play, you're used to playing in front of crowds, but I mean, was that a challenge for you, taking the team within that 30,000? Was that a bit of a different environment for you? Did you take something from that? Yeah, I think you it's, it's part of your coaching journey. I think learning, you have to learn so how you how you handle yourself in those key moments. You know, I think I definitely I definitely took things from those two games um, because obviously we lost both legs, and uh, you know that even though 94th minute away was the one that really hurt us, um, we lost at the bridge as well, and I think that one. When you realise that you're a coach still on the sideline, again, there was 18,000 at the bridge. Massive for Chelsea to have that. And you're the coach that everyone's looking at and things aren't going well. And you're the one who's going to have to stand in front of the media after. I think that that taught me a lot about myself. I certainly learned a lot from it to take into the next year when we, when we thankfully got the edge over a great Fulham team with Dembele and Robertson. And... I certainly made a big call in that one at half time to make three subs and I don't think if I'd have experienced it the year before that mental pressure being on the line um, and feeling very much alone I've got to be honest and that is a good thing because you've got to, you've got to find out about yourself because when you're playing you're part of a team and you're on the pitch and you can affect it when you're a coach you can only affect it by decisions you can affect it by showing player strength and when you're working with young players, that's a key part. And for me to make three subs at half time, it is still one of the, one of the biggest moments in my coaching career to, to date. Um, to do that, to take off the captain, Loftus Cheek, who obviously now is full in the international going to the World Cup, who I love. And 
have a great relationship even now with Ruben. But it was a big call. Thankfully, it worked out on another day. Somebody mm -hmm. could have got injured in two minutes, second half, and we would have lost him. So, so that, I think you learn from experiences and you build... You've got to be calm under pressure, haven't you? And that's that's one of the things. If you're going to be a coach or a manager, you have to be calm under pressure, whether there's two people or 20,000 people. It doesn't matter. And, um, yeah, I was pleased I stuck to my beliefs. And it's it's, it's formed quite a lot of the way I work, to be honest, that. So. And just tell us a little bit about then, you know, your, your style of play when you were at Union Chelsea and you had this success. You know, how did, how did the team play? How did you set them up? What was the you know the main the main things about the philosophy for the club? Yeah, well, the, well, there's a strong philosophy, as you know yourself, through that club to play. You know, I think the systems have changed slightly in the in, over the years I was there. It's not so much about the systems anymore because some teams play three four three, which was not a preferred system of mine to be honest. I preferred four two three one with either two wide players or three number tens. Certainly in the UEFA Youth League, where you know we uh, we had back-to-back -back triumphs in that. I I played three tens uh, a lot, and um, uh, it, it was fluid. You play out from the back. Obviously, you try to get your full-backs high. The centre halves have to be comfortable. Midfield players rotate. Um, you can rotate a full-back high, and one of the white midfielders in central pop out left or right. You've got to be very accomplished on the ball and then spot the weakness of the opposition to be able to go quickly when you need to. Um, obviously, you're fortunate. You've got players that can build pressure, keep teams penned in, uh, win the ball back quickly. Um, so we all, always, always my teams had a high defensive, obviously being an ex-defender, ethic to get the ball back as quick as you can. And if not, you have to work on all things, mid-press, low block, you know. So I think we work for it. all goalkeepers' uh, use of the ball, very important. If he couldn't go to one of his defenders, then could he drill it longer into a striker who then set it off and you played backwards rather than forwards? So many things that day-to-day -day you work on the training ground, movements, rotations, um, running with the ball, the ability to beat a player 1v1, um, you know, like I said, defenders being very comfortable knowing when they've got to clear it, when they can bring it down with time. Um, so what? So thinking about that then, your training week, what would a, what would a, um average training week look for you like with you with the 18s then or, or the 23s there you know, in, um, from day to day for yourself and for a player? Well, 18, 18s, as I said, it was easier. So if you played on a Saturday, Monday... Monday morning you do quite a light session, in the afternoon you do match reviews with each individual player, go through their clips, uh, look at strengths, uh, areas to improve, build that into a training philosophy for the coming week for each individual player. Tuesday, double session, small areas in the morning, so a lot of power work. Um, depending on numbers of players, how many you have, because I know everybody coaches with different groups. Sometimes you'd have eight. Sometimes you could have 20 outfield players, two, two keepers. So it depends. Afternoon, uh, individual work, technical, tactical, physical in the gym, sprint work with conditioners, um, all based individually on the, on the player, what they needed. Uh, Wednesday, bigger areas. So working more towards tactical maybe elements or, or a certain theme that you're working towards. I don't know, say you were playing you were playing Spurs on the Saturday, so you knew it was going to be a high-level technical game. On the Wednesday, I think you'd work on when you won the ball, trying to make the pitch big as quick as you could to try and get them open between their units because they were very good at a lot of technically gifted players that like the ball. Um, so you'd probably design training sessions around that. Uh, again, Wednesday afternoon, working on individual player meetings, maybe doing a tactical review with the team, showing them something from the week. Maybe it might be clips from match of the day. Uh, maybe a European game that somebody we'd seen that 
we felt was interesting to show them, maybe a, vi a documentary video, something like that. Um, and then Thursday, Thursday morning would be getting getting ready for your tactical work, really. Um, starting to nail down bits, bit more towards the game. Uh, and Friday, yeah, quick, short, sharp, lots of small-sided matches. Uh, if you picked the team and you wanted to do something, maybe you did it, you, you enforced it then, but a lot of the time you don't know your teams until very late in the day, especially at Chelsea because of, you know, the demands from above. And um, that was it, really. Yeah, get ready for the game on a Saturday and off on a Sunday. So. And so so what, you, the players doing the individual work, did you work much individually with the players? I mean, obviously, you're like I say, you're a defender. Uh, would you work with some of the defenders sometimes individually and talk to them about their their body shape or you know their positioning or stuff like that? Yeah, I mean we could, we, we tried. I mean obviously I worked with Andy Myers, who's another who was a top defender. Obviously he played for Chelsea as a schoolboy and you know he was, played a much higher level than me, Andy. But we we we'd really split across Sal. That you know when you work out how many staff, you know two conditioners. Uh, me and the other people that can do different bits. So not so much always with defenders. You know, I think when you're a defender, you know the runs that strikers used to make that cause you problems. So we'd work a lot on that as well. I think the, the individual elements depend on a certain player. It may be that he's predominantly stronger on his right foot and you have to work on his left foot receiving skills. If it's a, if it's a defender, it may be the timing of his jump. So you're incorporating a conditioner to try and get more power on his legs. So I think you build that in. You have meetings, obviously, every six weeks, talking around four individual players, and you build that into programs. It's, it's an ongoing process. But I used to enjoy, yeah, obviously being the head coach, I used to manage it, really. So as long as I knew where every player was at any given time of the day, and sometimes I was involved in it if I was busy with other stuff, then... And he would lead and he did a lot of the work individually and, you know, it seemed to work. And like I said, the gauges, how, how are they improving over the season or over three seasons? Because they're very young players and they, uh, they need a lot more than certainly first team players. You're expecting them to be the finished arc or whatever they are at 24, 25, really, they tend to be, even though I still think they can improve. But their mindsets are slightly different. And I mean, you were you blessed with a lot of uh, young talent there. For instance, you know, you, you had uh, Izzy Brown, uh, Solanke, uh, Tammy Abrahams, three of the best forwards in, you know, English football, maybe European football. How do you manage yeah. getting, I mean, I used to watch those guys and they used to rotate, play seven, 11, nine a lot. You know, yeah. how do you juggle, you know, just which one's going to play in the nine or which one's going to play out wide? You've got so much talent there. Yeah, I think you, I think you, well, when you had Masonda and Boga, then it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, quite an interesting front five. I think you, you have to look at each individual game cell or competition. So certainly in Europe, Izzy Brown was my captain, and you know, in the first year, Tammy was on the bench, and that's what happens. You can't all get in the team, so you want them to fight. I think they, they, you, you coach them in each position. So I think the fluidity of the system is geared by your players. You know, any system you work out on the strength of your players, and if you've got those three, like I said, and and Palmer, and Boga, and Masonda, and then you've got Colkin's left foot supplying passes, then they can play in any position, really. It's just working on what suits the team best for certain competitions, and that's how I did it. Izzy played on the side in Europe. Dominic was the nine. Sometimes I played them together uh, and played in diamonds. Other times uh, they played in different positions. But I think Dominic can play 10 or he could at youth level or 9. And I think as long as you do the work, you, sh you work on the strengths of them, show the opposition weaknesses, then um, you can't go far wrong really as long as your, your own knowledge, which is the key to coaching, you have to be able to get your own knowledge across and be very comfortable in your own knowledge because when you're working with top young players, if you're wrong, they will tell you. So you have to be able to handle that, players coming back at you and 
you know, I've always had a great belief in my ability and my knowledge, so I trust it. And uh, so you mentioned um, the uh, under 19s European tournament, amazing achievement to win that twice back to back. Just talk about uh, what, was that, what was that like going into Europe with the team for the first? What, was, what were the differences between playing your normal, you know, your normal uh, domestic fixtures? Was there any difference in you know playing those European competitions? Yeah, I think that obviously you notice straight away that the the, the teams are, are very well set up. The tempo is slightly different, um, slightly slower, I would say. Certainly with the Spanish, um, I think the whole the whole um, aura around it that UEFA Youth League because it was a new competition and you know Derm, bless him again, but uh, the the first year it was in it, Derm took the team and. They got to the quarterfinal and lost to Schalke um, at Cobham in a game. Really, they were favourites to win because they had a really strong team. It just didn't quite happen for them on the day. The interesting thing was my first campaign. We had Schalke in the first game, so mm. it, it was quite interesting to to approach it through that. I, I found it the life skills as well was was a big learning for the players in Europe because you're going to some war-torn countries in the group stage certainly went Israel um, you know and you've got fighter jets flying overhead while we're playing we weren't able really to leave the hotel we had armed bodyguards we went to Kiev um, you know we're in a pizza place eating with the team after the game in which we played well and they it was a good game so we're a good team but you've got you've got uh, soldiers with guns outside I mean it's you can't really uh, tell people about that unless you experience it. And we also went to Maribor, which was amazing because the people were so hospitable, so friendly and, and loved Chelsea. And I think for the players, it's really nice to see them in that environment. So it wasn't just on the pitch, but on the pitch, I certainly found myself coaching against outstanding coaches. Um, and I think when you did a move, they moved. It was a bit like chess. Um, so it really made you stretch, uh, get to certainly another level, which you had to. And, um, you know, thankfully, obviously, when we you get to Neon, if you get to the semi-finals and final, it does appear big because it's over a weekend. Two teams leave after the semi. The hotel gets a bit eerie. There's only two teams there. The, the pressure builds daily. Really, really fantastic environment to, uh, to work. And, yeah, we we're fortunate to... Uh, to come out on top in two very different teams. First team, the players you've mentioned, outstanding individual ability, really the best team that will probably ever play development football that I've seen. Um, when you add Andreas Christensen, obviously Chelsea first team and now at the back, Jade Silva, you know, Jake Clark Salter, all these players that have won on honours with England. Um, so it's an outstanding team and as long as I got them set up in the right places and tactically, then really nobody was going to live with them. The second year, much harder, much more different, but a group that really were all born in Chelsea. And um, we had an outstanding defensive team. And uh, that's what won us that, that title. We, we only conceded, I think it's less than double figures. We went 16 months unbeaten. So it is, you, you were breaking new records and it was phenomenal. And, and we really enjoyed it. The only downside was we weren't able to go for the treble because mm. Chelsea didn't qualify their first team, which was a bit sad at the time. And now I'm glad they've changed the rules. So now the winners get in. So uh, um, just think about that, AD. So to interrupt, mate. Um, just just you mentioned before about you know you, you like a game of chess. Can you give us an example of that? You know, so instance, when you've been in a game and then someone's made a change, what the change was and how, what you did to adapt and how do you get that message across to your players during the game? Well, it's okay. Ajax in the Ajax in the quarter final of the Champions League the second year uh, at Cobham. You know, Ajax were the best team we played in the in the two years I did the tournament, um, and they've got five that are in their first team now. So outstanding technical ability. Um, usually, we're the dominant team technically, as you would know. They were so we had to have a slightly different uh, approach. Um, and when the game started, they were right on the front foot. And um, an example, so I, I dropped the block. So we went a little bit deeper. So probably defended 
maybe 30 yards from the goal um, and then condense the space to be all the team within 25 yards. So we went from 30 to 55. So probably just on the D, the other side of the halfway line. And their coach, uh, when the change happened, what he did was he moved the middle of the back three, he put him in front and pushed him into a midfield position. Um, to to basically enable them to get another man into the attacking area, and they they tried to squeeze the pitch another five yards, so they wanted to make it 50 yards, which was really interesting how he did it and when he did it. Um, and then I, for me, get checked to counter that. Then I I asked Casey Palmer to start running in behind, so to use the space because they'd come so high. And uh, if you see the winning goal, Casey gets fouled by the sweeper, who's now playing in midfield, so he's moved. He fouls Casey. Casey takes a quick free kick, plays it into Tammy. Tammy back heels it to him about 35 yards from their goal. But Casey's running into a space where he would have been. But because they'd moved him, and we'd counted that, that Casey ran into the space, drew the other centre half slid it to Carl Scott and he scored and that happened to be the winning goal because we won 1-0 and um, yeah that, that's something what I mean about chess you, you, the, their coach was very good very talented but you're trying to get it but the players have got to execute it you can you can put any game plan you want and the information to how you get it on sale is quite easy you just, you just call one of the players if there's an injury or something which there was I was able to get Casey over to the side and explain to him. If not, then the fullback on my side, I would whisper in his ear and he would pass the information on. Again, big trust in the players to understand. Um, but obviously, most of these scenarios we would have covered in training anyway when we worked through strengths and weaknesses of opposition, especially in the, in the bigger games, um, because... He didn't really leave no no stone unturned, to be honest. So, do you think that that intelligence and that flexibility, the the adaptability you want in the players, do you, do you reflect in your time working with the twelves and fourteens, and then implementing things at that time? Is there stuff you can do with the younger players which starts them on that journey? I think now, I think now, I think you have to get you have to yeah. I think tactical information certainly when it gets to under fourteens. I certainly think now how it's changed in the last five years, development, I think that they need more tactical information at a younger age. So because they're, they're getting caught a little bit wanting when they get get to that 17, 18, so by then it's a little bit too late really. Um, so I think you can design, but again it's around the skill of the coaches to be able to design sessions that also still have the fun element at that age. Um, challenging to the environment and also uh, that that are impacting technic tactically even if the players don't really know that so um, yeah the skill of a coach so you're working out something you're showing them but you're you're disguising it if you like um, in a certain way and I think yeah I think that's a change that probably should be implemented now um, and it's certainly something that I'm talking to the academy coaches at Coventry at the minute about, which is obviously a lot lower down the chain, but trying to help them in certain instances by bridging the gap between that and the first team. So I think at Chelsea, easier because the under-14s are in, you know, they're in full-time if they're at the school or they're on day release. So you have the time to be able to do it and break the sessions down. So uh, trying to get the understanding, game understanding earlier. Yeah, and um, just lastly about Charles Chelsea. Then just um, you talk about all these great players, that great team. Obviously, that a lot of those guys haven't progressed um, as quickly as as we would have liked. Maybe what do you put that down to, and what what would what would you think would be could we uh, could we solve this problem, this apparent wall that a lot of these players are hitting? I think I think I've said this before, but um, certainly I was very fortunate to be coaching a golden generation if you like, if you, the results say that, you don't win as many youth cups or youth leagues or, or England tournaments with that many Chelsea players in if they're not top, top players and the gauge for me is everybody else wants them, so 
I think why they've not made it through comes down to one person. The manager of the first team picks the Chelsea players. Do they have to be world class? Yes. Is it a massive jump from an academy into Chelsea first team? Enormous. But have there been players good enough over the last decade? Yes. Fact. It's a fact. Um, but it goes back to unless you're going to implement it at the top end, that goes past the top of the academy into the top end of the first team, unless you're going to say to your coach, I want you to play young players and I expect X amount to be within your first team squad or team or bench or whatever, unless that get implemented, which is very difficult to do, then the problem will still arise. I know you're trying to get to the elite of European football, but we are talking about outstanding young talent that um, have moved on to pastures new and have flourished in certain instances, you know, and I, I hope the situation improves for Chelsea. Obviously, I'm not there anymore, um, but I hope the, the situation improves for them. But this year, to be fair, a few, quite a few have made debuts. Hudson Adoy is the youngest for many years. You know, Solanke obviously was very young when he made his debut, but that didn't materialise into as much as he wanted um, and probably deserved. But as I say, it's not. It wasn't my decision. It's not down to me. It's down to the manager, the individual man at the time. But what I will say that Antonio Conte has given quite a lot of players debuts over the last two years in the job, and uh, I would I would imagine on record that that's the most of any recently so when you change managers all the time as Chelsea tend to do then you have the same problem because somebody else may prefer another young player um, so it's a difficult one and uh, hard to give you a sorry not going around the hours or so but <laughs> it's, all right. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that problem that we've talked about in development all of us whether it's Chelsea or Man United or Man City they've got the same problem now you know, Guardiola plays Foden for eight minutes. You know, Conte plays uh, Hudson Odoi for eighteen minutes. Well, what, what's the difference? I don't, I don't see it. It's, it's not just Chelsea; it's a common problem, um, and I hope it gets resolved. Although, sadly, I think we'll still be talking about it in twenty years' time. So then, your uh, your next challenge is at is at Coventry. Just tell us how that came about. <laughs> Uh, well, I was enjoying a little bit of a sabbatical after leaving Chelsea, obviously. Um, I needed a break. You know, I'd had nine full-on years there. I, I was enjoying a few months uh, away from the game, um, going and studying a little bit. I went to Benfica and saw, I know a colleague who you've had a podcast with, Joao Trahelio, who's an outstanding yeah. coach. So I went there and spent five days with, with the excellent Benfica Academy, but... I did little bits. Mark Robbins, commentary manager, is a is an ex teammate of mine at Walsall. Not not that we're in touch that much and haven't been. He's had a couple of players off Chelsea, Alex Davy for one previously on loan, other clubs, and he just rang me. I'd just come back from holiday and um, he's, he'd had a problem with his number two. Sadly, who had been taken ill. And it was uh, initially he asked if I could come in for a few weeks and help him out. He was in a bit of a pickle. Um, I thought about it. I looked at the size of the club. Obviously, they shouldn't be where they are, but there's a lot of teams that can say that. I looked at their players. Most of their players are geared to play at a higher level. And uh, I just thought it might be an interesting challenge, maybe get me back on the grass. Um, and I went in initially for six weeks, and ten months later, here we are. We're still here, and um, we've just uh, experienced a, a big high at Wembley, and uh, thankfully got back into a, a league that is more uh, fitting for the for the club. So, tell, what were your initial thoughts on as you went into the club? I mean, obviously, you you you're, you played in a lot of clubs before. I mean, you know, you know, you've been around, as it were. So, just what what was the main contrast of going in there? For work from your experience at Chelsea, for instance. Well, you soon realise that obviously you're working with, as I said, at Chelsea I was fortunate, international weeks I coached all the first team players at different times as well over three years, so I was lucky, um, so I'd had an inkling, 
but you're talking about senior professionals um, that are a little bit set in their ways, not being disrespectful to them, um, and to try and bring about a change, uh, certainly in the way they work day to day, because my my training and, and philosophy and sessions are very intense. So, so to try and work that into and implement that, that was the biggest challenge to to get them to understand why and what you were doing, and that it, you can you can do it in a different way, and probably a way that they've not seen before in their careers. And I fully respect the fact that a lot of them are, like I say, mid twenties and have built a career and they've had decent careers. But I just tried to show them a different way of working. Um, you soon realise, obviously, that you're not working, again, not being disrespectful, you're not working with the talent I was fortunate to work with, but that makes it a bigger challenge as a coach. And I certainly, one of the biggest reasons I took it on was about that. Could I implement my work into a League Two club um, and try and change uh, the way they play? Because they've got players that want to play football, there's no doubt. They're suited more to football than they are the physical elements of, say, a Lincoln or a Notts County or some of the teams that we faced in this league that, that are very good at what they do, but Coventry are not that way. So there was a lot of challenges, uh, a lot of barriers to break down. Obviously, I had they, they've got an excellent academy that have brought through a lot of top players that have gone on to, to play at the highest level for their country. And also, you know, they keep producing. So I really enjoyed the interaction that the 23s work very closely with the first team. They train on the pitch next to them, so you're able to see the young talent. Of, uh, out Being able to implement the, the bits I did with the young players at Chelsea into the players at Coventry, i.e. reviews after matches, individual breakdowns, which I did for anyone who was 21 or under. That was great. Um, so yeah, a lot of challenges to break down. A so lot did, of did you? Um, did, sorry to interrupt you, Aidy. Mate, so did you did you go in and play the same way? Then was it right? This is you know this is my philosophy. I played this way, and I mean this that's was it was. Or was, did you have to be a little bit more flexible in in, in some of the things you're asking the players to do? No, I mean obviously my remit was to. I'm not the manager, so yeah. Mark's the manager. I'm the number two. So my remit is is to take the training sessions, to design the training sessions. Obviously, I go over them with the manager. And again, it was new for him. So a lot of the stuff, you know, Mark played at the highest level for Man United, uh, Leicester, Norwich, all in the Premier League. Had a wonderful career, top striker. But it's his sixth job as a manager. And I think even for him, you know, some of the ways of working and certainly the possession drills and being able to get everything out, position-specific work, he hadn't seen before not being horrible so you know for him he was educating and learning as well but in terms of how the team plays that's down he's the manager so so i mean so how did that work then in terms of your your role as the assistant i mean so tell us about it. you go in he says look this is the way i want to play or this is off this philosophy and you go and then you go and arrange the sessions around that yes yeah so you, you again your skill i want to look at this we're playing this team on saturday and okay, so I say okay, and then right on the board, design a session around that for him for a Tuesday, another session on a Thursday, which is more tactical, building into Saturday, and he goes yeah or nay or maybe do maybe can we look at something there or whatever, and you just you have dialogue. That's obviously I know the role, the role's different. I'm not the main person. I'm certainly not enforcing the sessions on him I'm just showing him a different way to get what he wants um, and yeah we played sometimes we played 4-4-2 but still the same principles apply in the fact that how do you manipulate the ball to be able to get your better players in space how do the strikers rotate sometimes we played 4-2-3-1 which is obviously a system that you know I'm very comfortable with probably more so than the manager so that, again, needs more trust. And you build trust over time. Obviously, the trust at the start when we worked, he's getting to know a different person. He's worked with the same assistant at six different clubs. So he has to also get to you. And I think the trust 
builds over time. And I think in the last six weeks of the season, including the three playoff games, the semis and the final, I saw the work finally being implemented after a long, long process. And obviously, there's the difference. At Chelsea, with young, top young players, you'd expect it to be implemented quicker. Um, and it's more about developing the individual. At Coventry, you need results. Um, and you're building that into a philosophy for the team to be successful and with individuals to shine in it. You know, Chelsea, um, I, I implored that it was team first. So the work rate... And then, obviously, individual, top individual players shine anyway, and you improve, find the missing 1%. At Coventry, you're trying to find the missing 1% in the team, and in the end, we, we managed to hit the peak at the right time. So, there's a lot of satisfaction, although it was a very, very difficult and long process to get to the end result. So I just want to, I mean, before we talk about the difference between working with the young players there and the pros at Coventry, just flip back a little bit, um, because you did mention it. What was it like when you got the opportunity to work with the first team players at Chelsea and compared with the young players that you'd been working with, even though they're really, you know, some of the best young players in Europe? Yeah, well, you get, obviously, you're, you're challenged more. First thing I noticed that they appeal for every single decision <laughs> in every game you did, whether it's possession, which I didn't mind, but they challenge, they challenge you more. I think trying it on is probably the right word. First time you work with them, they sort of go, oh, well, we'll see what you got. Um, and I can imagine that. Um, just just the, the, the speed in which they do things compared to the young players was, the, was another big thing that struck me. When they wanted to go through the gears, they did. I mean, obviously, I tried to challenge them. I got a lot of positive feedback through the sessions from the ones. You've got to manage different characters. You know, Ivanovic to <laughs> Ivanovic to Fabregas to Willian is certainly a very different three, for example. I love working with John Terry. He was an outstanding trainer. Uh, very positive, always talking about bits. You know, and I think the biggest gauge when you work with seniors is can you make them feel that the session's all designed around them? Uh, and the key is that you're trying to design it around 20 players. But if they all feel all that bit was for me, then, you know, that done your job. And I think we've, I certainly found it very challenging, not the actual coaching, but preparing the sessions for first team players because you're having to cover every detail. And, you know, I hope I plan like that every day anyway, but you're having to cover details and making sure that nothing get, gets missed because they pick up on it straight away and you, you certainly get told about it. So uh, and, and you talked about, you know, you work with some of the best managers in the world. Which manager do you think had the biggest influence on you while you were at the club? Uh, that's a good question. I mean... Uh, I'm not observing observing Mourinho um, just because the level of detail that went into his planning. So, you know, I was fortunate at that time to be changing in the first team changing room. So I changed in the facility with him and his staff. And, you know, even that was a challenging environment because he challenged you at times um, about young players and talking about players' progressions. And, you know, he, he, he would get into debates if he wanted to. But watching him on the grass... You know, he had an aura about him and, and uh, I certainly, I, I never copied him. He, you know, he said to me one day, hey, do you never, you never do any of my sessions, like in a joking way. Um, and I said, no, I don't copy. That's not, that's not what I want to do. I, I like watching you because, you know, I said, you, your detail is second to none and the way you conduct yourself is what I look at more, the, the, the mannerisms, the, the, the body style, the, the way you move in, interact, the way you move in and out of sessions. But to copy you is, is uh, you know, is not really what I'm here for. Um, and he just giggled and walked away. So, you know, I was being very complimentary, but I don't see the point in copying somebody, I think, as I said before. So him, definitely in terms of detail, um, but I was fortunate. I think I took every, I took little bits from every manager I played under, 
from Lou Macari at Swindon in terms of physical work. Alan Pardew at Reading was very, very good on at that stage, 2000, in the sessions moving quick, four minutes, six minutes, moving it on, on the whistle, really high tempo work. Glenn Otto at Swindon, uh, amazing player manager, 33, absolute world-class player to watch him in training. So he was more showing because he had the ability to do it. Um, you know, I, I took so Jan Mulby at Kidderminster, uh, another amazing footballer, but brilliantly calm with his players, a bit more laughy-jokey, able to relax them at the right times. Good storyteller, obviously. Um, so I think you take things from everybody you work with, but definitely Mourinho in terms of uh, the managers I observed, yeah. And then so going thinking about your your first you know few few sessions with the the guys at Coventry, what are the main you know contrast then? What was it like working with those guys, those those pros? Of they come from lots of different journeys than those guys from Chelsea. What are the main challenges yeah. you know motivating those guys and getting those guys to buy into what you're doing? Yeah, first thing first thing I noticed was the tempo, so the speed in which they did anything was uh, was too slow, without being disrespectful. So I'd identified that really early, that that was what I was going to have to try and change. So the the uh, the intensity to anything I, we did. And over time, yeah, the, it worked. And now they're unrecognisable. So that, um, uh, they, the, the fact that they like to moan at each other a lot. So there was a lot more um, confrontations between each other. Um, and I think that that's because you got winners. So there was a, quite a lot of um, disagreements. Um, getting over barriers of, of them liking to do a certain thing on a certain day. Oh, well, we usually do games on a at this time on a Thursday. You know, le, le, comments like that. And I think that's been a that, that's something I'm very proud of. To having to change that and them now go, well, what are we doing now? When are what are we doing? What are we doing? So they don't say when are we doing X. They now go, what are we doing now? So they've got a bit more open-minded learning. You can't change everybody, but I think you have to try and. And I, like I say, I wasn't trying to change them. I was just trying to show them a different way of working, to challenge them in a different way. I think. The biggest thing they found is the mental challenge of uh, training with me is high. So, because because it's a challenging environment I create, the learning is massive if they get it, but it's also challenging. I think there's been a little bit of give and take on that, to be honest, and um, I think we've both found our medium in the end. And yeah. and tell us then what was like a just run through um, a, you know a, a, a normal type week you'd have with the with the players there for them and for yourself. Coventry a normal week. Well, if we play a league game on a Saturday, so then obviously off Sunday, Monday, the play a bit of a split really. So the players that play started the game would come in and do probably the first forty five minutes, maybe 30, 45 minutes of the session. So. The warm up, the passing drills, light stuff, maybe on the outsides of possessions to just get their legs moving again. Then they go with the conditioners and do quite a long stretching and in the gym session. The other boys, subs, 23s, maybe combine and do a longer session, so a bit more intense uh, after. Tuesday, main probably main day of the week in terms of the work, so 90 minutes. Um, depending on numbers, what we would do. Probably a lot more generic, not really geared towards the game. So, you know, maybe uh, possessions smaller, two groups, different things, swap over, crossing and finishing drills, uh, 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s, stuff like that. And then games. Then afternoon, they would do uh, gym, so power. In the league, in the league, certainly at Coventry, they do quite a lot of that, um, which again is led by the manager and conditioners, not me. Um, and then individual work with certain players, some of the younger boys, 21 and under, outside, working on their core skills, whatever they would need. Uh, maybe reviews with me, the younger two or three that are in the team. 
Wednesday is a day off. Thursday, starting to build in your tactical work for the game on Saturday. Um, 11 v 11 work. Um, May manager swapping over players in positions, etc. Geared towards again, uh, geared towards the game. Friday, so the team really, the manager likes to work. He says the team maybe does a little bit on his own in terms of the team stuff on a Friday. I take the subs and do another element, another session, so they're not stood around uh, and then set pieces all together. Um, and, and that builds into the Saturday. If we play Tuesday, then obviously Monday is uh, is light for, for the players that have played on Saturday. They really do nothing. Cool down, little jog. The other boys do an hour, and then we're we're ready for a Tuesday game. So it just depends on different weeks. So I mean, that's must be must be quite a challenge there. You know, with a lot of the weeks there is two games. Getting getting your uh, your work done, if you like, because I suppose you're just managing the load and recoveries for much of that time. Yeah, yeah, it's, it definitely is a challenge, a more bigger challenge at senior level. Uh, certainly, league football, league two. You know, without being disrespectful, it's a brutal league, um, really physical. Uh, so to play three games in seven days at this level, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday is very very tough. Um, and you've also got to make sure that the boys that may be a sub on a Saturday and then starting on the Tuesday or sub on the Tuesday starting Saturday, that they get the, the majority of work in. But again, it's the challenge of a coach and a, and a, and a management team to, to liaise with the conditioner, the physios, to make sure that individual needs are met. And you've also got the balance from, you know, we've set our captain's 30, he's nearly 37 years of age. He's just played 52 games in central midfield. Amazing fitness. And we've got a young boy who's 17 playing in with him. So to get that 20 years difference balance right, it is a key. And, um, you know, you get your horses for courses, so you give, you give benefits. But that's no real different to academy football development because sometimes players are coming back from long-term injuries. You have to incorporate them into your training programme. So... Yeah, I think it's very individual, and I think senior football, the more staff that are coming into, I mean, obviously we have nowhere near the number of staff that I did at Chelsea. You know, Mark manages half the number I managed with the 23s group in terms of just staff. So we don't have that luxury, um, and it is a challenge at times, and you have to work across two, three different areas and cover each other, and... That's part of it. Probably makes you close together, I would imagine. But yeah, it's a challenge. And and so what about you know the the pressure then playing there now in, in senior football at that level? What's how do you what is the pressure like? How do you manage that? What's the game day pressure like? Trying to get things change things on the pitch. Uh, well, again, slightly different role. So on a match day, you know, I do the the warm up before the game, <laughs> which you know. I, I haven't done for a few years until this, um, which I quite enjoy. So you're out with the players. I think my role as a number two is is uh, knowing when to step in and not. So I, I'm, I'm quite calm with them before the game. I don't really put a lot of information into them because my I do a lot of that on a Thursday. So if I'm doing tactical, I try and get as much information in as soon as I can. Match day then is about making sure the manager's okay, making sure he's comfortable with everything, and and again picking picking the right time when the game starts to go up and maybe chat to him and, and mention something tactically or has he seen or checking that he's seen a team maybe setting up slightly different than we planned for, um, or if he comes back and asks me information, making sure I've got it. And then I think at half time because we both speak, he goes first, and then I. He's making sure that you just have two, three key points that he hasn't covered that are slightly different. So I always make notes on the line uh, at games, um, which is different than I used to do when I was the lead, um, because I think you have it in your head then. You you know what you're seeing. I think as an assistant, you just got to make sure that you're. Yeah, you're covering maybe all the areas that 
the manager's caught up in the game so he doesn't see everything by his own admission and I say you work as a team so slightly different challenge um, pressures you feel the pressure as a group of staff I mean obviously the, the pressure on me is nowhere near as much as it is on the manager but at the end of the day it's senior football you're in a dog eat dog industry if you lose four games now at Coventry it's the same as losing four games at Chelsea you're going to be under pressure um, in development I think as long as the the club can see that the players are improving individually and that the, the, the way you're trying to play is the way of the philosophy of the academy, then I think obviously losing four in a row isn't going to get you anything more than having a conversation with Neil and trying to get some support. Um, it's not a very nice place, but it goes on. That's life. In senior, the pressure builds every time you don't get a result and it makes it a difficult week when you haven't got a result. So... You know, that, that was interesting, seeing that it really was all about winning. Uh, and I found that quite a different culture change, uh, in a good way in some ways, because it makes you more alert and, and on the money. But, yeah, it's, it, there's pressure in every walk of life, isn't there? So I think, again, you build the pressure on yourself. If you want to be successful, then you're going to challenge yourself to 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 put pressure we certainly and I went in there from day one the aim this year at Coventry was to get back to league one at the first attempt they got relegated last year the manager only came in towards the end results picked up but it was too late they were going down anyway they won the checker trade trophy at Wembley so the club was a little bit on up he changed 14 players very difficult and it took that's probably why it took all season for it really to click um, but from day one I was told the aim was to get promotion I felt it was a bold aim when I first walked in there being honest I told him that looking at the players they definitely needed to be some improvements they've got some real top quality players they have miles better than the level but overall they were probably around 8 and top 8 maybe where, where we were in and out all the time, all season. So the pressure came. Obviously, when you get to the playoffs, then it's massive pressure anyway. Um, and I quite enjoyed the playoffs. So tell us, tell, us, tell us a little bit something about tell us about the playoffs and particularly the final. What was that like in that the intense? Uh, must you know, I imagine it must be you know real, you know pressure cooker atmosphere to you know borrow a phrase. Yes. Well. Yeah. I mean we. You know, it is, it is, it is a pressure. You can't get away from it. You know, you, it builds during. We had ten days, so we managed to plan quite well going into. It. I think we realised that after that, we sort of got that as well, or as well as we could. We gave the players break as well as we went away for a couple of days and to Champions. There's a pitch there, health place. Gave the players a little bit of downtime, but we trained as well. Um, we went to Wembley the night before. We watched the the League One player final when we got there, you could feel the anticipation build. And obviously we took 40,000 people. So you, you, I think when you walk out of Wembley, and obviously it's special, especially it was special to have coached there now, um, which again is another tick on the on your moving forward. But I think you realise that it's a winner takes all game. And when that whistle blew, at the start, it certainly didn't feel like any other game. Um, and we tried to play it down like that to the players, but there was no way you could you could do that. Um, Is it what was there any strategies to obviously you've got a lot of young players in the squad you talked about? I mean, and a lot yeah. of, maybe a lot of those other guys at Chelsea had, had experience of playing finals before. I mean, what are your strategies to try and calm the nerves of these young players, particularly? Well, we did. We uh, we the night before in the hotel, the the analyst and the manager, very cleverly and, and brilliantly done, had managed to get video messages from all the players' families. Um, so whether it was the ones who've got children or the youngest one, who it was his parents, you know, and that was that was quite special how they put that together, showing clips of the season, of them individually, and then a message. And I think that. That certainly helped with calm and making them know how proud everybody was and whatever happened. I think when you get to the pitch, certainly our two youngest players, Bayliss and Shipley, definitely in the first half, 
they that the nerves were there you could see um, and I think that's very difficult because if you tell someone don't be nervous then they're going to be nervous um, so I think just trying to get them to relax maybe to get used to the surroundings and I think it took probably took 45 minutes for the whole team to to come to terms with the enormity of the occasion the situation and certainly realized it was nothing like a check of trade final the year before when I think four of them played where really that's to win a trophy this was to get back up a league it's much bigger um, so yeah I personally felt first half it was nil nil half time I, I felt we were the team in the ascendancy we just needed to uh, we needed to score and once we scored I think that would have been that was going to be it. it just took it was just a matter of time when second half we obviously scored very early I think when it went 3-0 with 19 minutes to go um, yeah, I certainly felt a little bit emotional at that time, if I'm being really honest. You, for a moment, you, you allow yourself to drift, uh, which you shouldn't do, but it's a natural reaction, and you sort of try and think about what's going to happen at the end of the game and making sure you're calm, and, and it does get you a little bit, um, and I admit it would, but you, know, you soon get brought back down to earth, because when I was at Swindon, with Hoddle in 93, we played Leicester in the final at Wembley and we were 3 up and it, they came back to 3-3. Three, three. Um, and we won 4-3, but I quickly got out of it. But obviously, the final whistle is an amazing feeling. Your 12 months of work have gone into 90 minutes. You've come out the right side. There's a lot of relief, a lot of um, emotion, um, and, and, and mainly a lot of a chance for players and staff to to see each other in a different light I think and that's the biggest thing I'll take the the scenes on the pitch after you know it, if you could bottle them um, you, you'd keep them with you forever sadly they're over very quickly and it's on to the next campaign and that's life but it was uh, again being able to give the right information to the manager seeing the players actually implement the game plan uh, the three key points that we implemented into them that they did brilliantly, I felt very proud of that because that's taken a long time to get to that stage and I wouldn't have been able to achieve that earlier in the season and nor would they. So big pat on the backs to them. They're the ones that play and and they deserve what they got because they uh, certainly were the best team in the playoffs. There's no doubt uh, about that. Where would you put that then in terms of achievements in your career? That's an amazing, you know... Uh, victories throughout your career where would you put that that playoff victory uh, it, it's right up there yeah it's right up there with uh, you know when you're doing it as a player when you achieve as a player you, you, you're part of a you're part of a team but you're an individual player so you're trying to do it uh, yeah to to what improve your life improve your family and improve your working conditions I think when you're a coach, to, to to try and get your ideas and see them come to fruition, it may, probably probably makes you more prouder, extremely proud of. I was to play 20 years. I was lucky, but you know I had a good career. Not great, I had a good career. My my ambition has always been to try and be a better coach than I was a player. From when the day I set out, could I be a better coach? That doesn't mean I have to work at a higher level. But could I be a better coach than player? And um, it's certainly right up there. Yeah, it's right up there with all the achievements. And I have been very lucky. But it, it certainly meant as much, if not more. Probably, probably because of you know leaving the way I did, uh, Chelsea, uh, being out of work, um, not really understanding that. Uh, even though there's a lot of top coaches out of work, but you know, finding that difficult when you feel you've done a really good job um, to get your head around that and then being given an opportunity probably in a level you probably didn't think you'd work in because you may not be able to think that you can relate to that level having where you've just worked for a decade but that's why I'm proud because to get those messages across and be able to change the way they think 
and also play and the style in which they play now is definitely my proudest moment in football to date. So proudest is definitely that. Fantastic. So what are your, your aspirations then, you know, as uh, for the future? Well, I think anybody, Sal, who, who, who's in coaching, you, you want to you wanna coach at the highest level with the, with the best players available. So, you know, I'd like to work with, I'd like to get back to working with top, top players, but maybe on a senior level. Um, but I just want to be, I just want to be able to make a difference uh, in what I do. And I want to be able to implement my ideas into players and, and hopefully see that come to fruition. And yeah, the, aspirations is still to be to be a winner. I'm born, I'm a born winner. My record says that as a player, it says it as a coach. So I enjoy winning. I think, you know, it, there's luck in any element of winning, of course. But I think winning is a massive part of development, not just for yourself, but also as players. And you know, I, I hope. Uh, there's many more successes to come. Well, I was going to say with your track record, I think I have a few quid on Coventry next season because uh, you got a pretty good uh, winning uh, record as it goes throughout your last few years. Funny, um, what what advice would you give for like an aspiring coaches? Obviously, this is a coach and coaches podcast. You know, um, you, you've you know you've had such a fantastic career already. What, what advice would you give to a young coach, up and coming coach, starting up in their, early on in their career? Uh, I think the biggest advice I give to a coach now, if I was a coach now, a young coach, was try and seek as much information as you can off senior people because I think that nowadays it seems to be that young people in general um, have a lot of art, all the answers they feel. And I think, you know, I, I was fortunate to work with some top-end senior people early and I think that really helped helped me. Uh, learn and develop and shape and I think nowadays I think they get left aside a little bit without being disrespectful to anybody so I think try and learn from everybody get a big rounded opinion but ultimately be yourself so a young aspiring coach what do you bring question ask yourself every day what do you bring that makes you you Uh, and can you implement that into your work Uh, and if you can do that then you won't go far wrong and uh, what about advice for um, a young player starting on their journey and wanting to play at the highest level? Work harder than your friends sitting next to you. Um, it all goes back to hard work. Um, have you got the dedication? Again, question, ask yourself as an inspiring player, young player, have you got the dedication to give up things or choices, make choices that you are not going to be popular with your friends that are doing normal day-to-day jobs uh, question mark if you can answer yes to that all the time then you're giving yourself the best chance to have a very successful career which will ultimately change your life so you're asking yourself can you be dedicated for 20 years maybe even 10 10 years of your life to make sure that you have a wonderful 60 years of life Um, so can you work harder than your friends sitting next to you? Uh, if the answer is yes, then you're not going to be far wrong. And um, and learn, keep learning. Don't don't never be too old to learn as a player. Uh, you don't have to be a teenager to learn. You can keep learning at any age. And finally, this one's a bit of a, a personal one for me. One of my best friends is an obsessive Coventry fan. Uh, ben yeah. Sprung, he's got kids called Charlie and Maxwell. They're obsessive fans as well. They travel up from London to all the games. I guess we could say a quick hello to Charlie and Maxwell Sprung, could you, for the big Coventry fans? Hello, Charlie. Hello, Maxwell Sprung. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your continued support and for uh, your dad bringing you up to all the games at the Rico. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed uh, the experience of Wembley and Coventry getting back into League One and we hope to give you many more special days uh, in the coming season. Lovely. AD, thanks very much. Appreciate it for coming on the show. It's been amazing. Top man. Cheers, up. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. 
MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game. 